Welcome to the Art of Retouching Studio. My name is John Ross and this is Behind the Retouching. This image was commissioned to me by Advanced Photoshop Magazine for issue number 136. In this episode, I'm not only going to be talking to you about how I created this image in Photoshop, but also I'm going to be talking quite a bit about the behind the scenes and what happened that led me to this particular image because sometimes despite all your best practices, things don't always go the way that you had hoped. This past spring, I had one of the busiest seasons I ever had. I was doing a lot of work, and I actually reached a point that I was no longer going to do any new commission work because I just didn't have the time. And just like clockwork, the very next day, Advanced Photoshop Magazine contacted me and asked me if I wanted to do a movie poster. I thought it would be interesting, so I told them to send me all the specifications. So when they sent back all the information, they also gave me this image here that had already been started on a retouch with the basic costume design. And it also said they wanted to match the dark and gritty poster style of current superhero posters. They said that I could put in a city background or a smoky fog of some sort against a black background. They'd also sent me some leather texture to wrap around the model. And they also sent some graphic art that they, they said could be used for the graphic on the front. The thing of it was, when I looked at the cities that they had supplied to me, they didn't exactly match this model who's just standing there. They were like all different angles and things. And, and since I'm very realistic when I do my artwork, it really didn't work for me as far as how I thought this poster would have ended up. And then also due to the time constraints, I figured I would just do a smoky background against the black and call it a day. So I began doing research on what movie posters were currently doing as far as styles go. One of the constants I noticed is that many of these posters had the actor up close, head only, and they were looking directly at the viewer. The thing is, I realized that when they're looking directly at you, it's very unnerving, meaning you can't keep staring at them. You actually want to look away. You know, when you look at this image, you don't feel right. And so you want to look at something else. Here's another one. He's looking right at you. You don't feel right. This one, she's looking at you. But basically, I thought it was an interesting observation. So then as I continued on, I realized that the actors were shot many cases from the waist up and occasionally from the knees up. So if you look at some shots that are a little bit farther back, here it is at the torso, here it is at the knees, here he is at the knees, here's the torso, torso, you get the idea. So it was either up really close or backed off a little bit, but it was a very rare situation that you actually saw a model that went from head to toe. So based off of the specifications and the existing styles, I figured I would end up cropping the person somewhere around the waistline. The other thing I noticed is that this costume looks very much like Tron. And that became a problem because I didn't want this image to look just like existing movie posters. So I had to change it in some way. So I thought that going with the misty smoke might enhance this image a little bit just so that so it wouldn't be as obvious that this costume is based generally on Tron. The graphic that they supplied to me came from a neon sign, so I could tell that they were also seeing the same type of thing with this costume that I did. Because I was really busy with my schedule, I wasn't able to start working on this image right away. In fact, it sat there for several days until I finally had a break in my schedule that I could sit down and focus on working on this image. And unfortunately, by that point, I had already hit the weekend and the thing was due on Monday. So that meant I had Saturday and Sunday to do the artwork, write the article, and get it submitted before the deadline. And this is actually the first draft that I came up with, wrote the article for, and submitted by Monday morning. Within five minutes of submitting it, they came back to me saying that they couldn't accept it. They gave several different reasons, but basically they said that I didn't use the texture that they wanted, they didn't like the smoke in front of the model, and their biggest complaint was that I didn't use the full figure. The real problem that I had with this is, how do you create all that detail when the model is head to toe? You can't get enough information in this area. I was really concerned that you wouldn't see this detail because it would all be so tiny on the page. Now, generally speaking, I would have preferred to have submitted this image to them for approval before completing the entire project. But as I said, my time frame just didn't allow that and I did what was requested of me. Even the samples that they gave back to me had everybody that was cropped at the knees or the, or the waist. Now this was going to interfere with all my deadlines for the rest of the week because now I had to redo this entire image as well as modify the article that I had written. 
So for my second time around, I decided to actually use everything that they suggested that I use. This way, there would be no question about what I was doing. And that's when I came up with this image here. The biggest problem that I had was I couldn't find commercially available artwork for the background that I could use that matched the position of the model. So after spending a couple hours looking around for a background, I finally took my camera and I went into the nearest city and began shooting backgrounds for myself. And this image happens to be one of the very last ones I shot for the day as the sun was going down and the lights were coming on. And once I got home and evaluated everything, this background matched the model and the position and everything. Now I just needed to go find myself a thundery sky background, composite it all together, add some rain, and do the artwork for the model's legs. Because I could reuse everything from the waist up it was just the waist down that I had to create. Now quite honestly, I hope this prints better than it looks inside of Photoshop because at this size, I can't see much detail going on at all. It's not until I actually zoom in on the image that you can begin to see that the entire image is covered by rain. You have extra leather texture in the costume. I added the graphic logo and even rain bouncing off of the costume. as well as down here on the ground. So when you get up close, there's a lot going on. The problem is, once this actually hits the page like this, I'm not sure how much detail will actually be retained. So I finished the image, I modified the article, and I submitted it to the magazine. So now I have two images that are similar, but not quite the same, and I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do with them. And now, I really wasn't sure how much of this backstory I was going to do inside of the video, but I really decided that if I couldn't talk about this, then what was the point in even having this? So I decided to record all this in order to help you make some better decisions. And be sure to always get approval from your clients before you spend all that time doing all that extra work. So now let's talk about how I actually built this image. A little known fact about me is that 22 years ago, I worked for Marvel Comics. That's like an entire lifetime ago. But anyway, back then everything was done by hand. They didn't even have computers in the offices then. There was actually one Macintosh computer and nobody knew how to use it. I think it was like me and one of the interns. Back then the best that we had was Photoshop version 2. And back then we didn't even have layers. But it was back then that I had the idea to turn photographs into images like these. And I actually put together a comic book that looked something like this. The problem was the answer that I got back is that it would be way too costly to do. Of course, that was 20 something years ago and nobody even knew how to use Photoshop back then. And today it wouldn't be costly to do, it would just be time consuming. And then of course you need the skill set to really get into Photoshop and do some incredibly complex special effects. This is of course well above and beyond normal photo retouching. And what I'm gonna show you is less about the individual steps and a lot more about how I solved the problems and overcame them with a level of creativity and Photoshop skill. Now, nothing I'm gonna show you here is particularly complicated in retrospect. The thing was, trying to solve every little problem as I go and have each part build upon the next part, ultimately leading the image to success. And that's the big takeaway here solving one problem at a time. Now this is the original image that's already been silhouetted with the background removed. I have absolutely no idea what I did with the actual background. I actually managed to do this. I'm not quite sure what I was thinking at the time, but here we are. So in order to do a silhouette like this, it really requires you to go in and do it very slowly piece by piece inch by inch and pixel by pixel. Getting in here nice and close and using quick mask in order to start silhouetting around the entire image. Now I'm not gonna go through an entire masking of this image because I have videos on my website, www.theartofretouching.com that show this technique and how I mask out all of my full figure images. But needless to say, this is how I would do it going around the entire figure coming out of quick mask and then applying that to a layer mask. After the basic silhouette has been created, because she has all this flyaway hair going on, we need to click on the mask, 
open up the properties palette and then click on mask edge. Once again, I actually have several videos on my website that cover refine mask, otherwise known as refine edge. But in short, you click this tool here and simply begin painting. But once you get it looking the way that you like it, click OK, and it will then refine that mask, hopefully in a way that allows this hair to blend in seamlessly with the background. But in this case, we don't actually have a background yet. I'm going to show you the rest of the breakdown on the model first before we get into the whole background topic. Now this particular layer is a smart object, however there's nothing actually inside of this smart object, meaning if I double click on it and I open it up, you can see all it is is just the base image by itself. The benefit of putting this inside of a smart object is that I can now scale this using free transform and I can make it bigger or smaller all I want. It just gives me more flexibility later on. These other two smart filters that I have attached to this do something that looks incredibly weird once I turn it on by darkening up her face like that and making it black and white. However, it actually makes sense at the end once I show you some of the other steps. The next two layers that I'm going to show you are a little bit risque and not necessarily safe for work, but we're all adults here. Get over it. The core problem is I need to get rid of her underwear but I simply can't put the costume over the top of her when she has this patterned black bra. Now something that I do that seems a little bit crazy is that when I'm watching shows like Game of Thrones or Spartacus, ones that have gratuitous nudity but without the sexual implications, basically meaning women that are just standing around naked, men that are just standing around naked, I'll actually go through those scenes and take screenshots of them and put them all into an archive. This way, when a situation like this arises, I have nude models that I can grab pieces parts from and drop them in. Again, I'm not looking for anything sexual, I'm just looking for nude models that I can swap out body parts for. Think of it along the lines of taking pictures of skies that are interesting so that you can simply drop them into less interesting skies in your other photographs. It's the same basic concept. But anyway, so the first one that I have here is this layer, which I don't know what TV show this is from, but I just take a piece of it, drop it in, rotate it, scale it up, and then mask out as needed. Now, of course, this isn't high quality or anything, but since I'm putting stuff over the top of this and concealing it anyway, it really doesn't matter. I'm just trying to give myself something that's a little bit more consistent than the black patterned underwear. So for the next layer up, I'm going to show you what it looks like, but I am going to conceal the actress's face because if you saw it, you would instantly recognize her. But anyway, this is the shot as it was. I dropped it in, scaled it a little bit just so that the upper torso matches, but obviously the arms don't. Now this next layer up is a cloning layer, and by itself it doesn't really make much sense. I mean, it actually looks like I'm making it worse than it was, but that's only because the rest of the costume isn't there. If you actually look, you can see I'm really just trying to break up the pattern a little bit. And then up top, I'm just blending it a little bit better. Now because the costume going over the top is black, I'm less worried about having the colors match. I'm more interested in having the general tones matching the way that I want it to look and having smoother gradients. Now the next layer group up has me working on the eyes and the teeth. Basically, I'm just whitening them up with a simple curve as well as a hue saturation set to colorize. The intent of this layer is to put a little bit more color inside of her iris. The next layer up involves cloning. However, when I turn it on, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, mainly because the lower part is still turned off, which is down here at the bottom. I have this smart filter where it is doing a smart sharpen, but more interesting is down here with this camera raw where I'm partially turning it to a black and white. Let me show you. Now, like I said, out of context, it really doesn't make any sense. But the base problem is that when I was working on this image, I wanted to change it and alter it and give it more of a comic booky, artistic look. I didn't want it to be a straight photograph. Where my biggest challenge on this was the image itself wasn't as high resolution as I would have hoped. So this was one of my ways of cheating it out, is to add extra contrast and change the color or grading of it. But anyway, adjusting her face like that and then the cloning 
now the cloning layer makes sense and it blends in. And in this case here, I'm simply removing areas around the eyes, her lips, and her nose. And then just some general cleanups. And that's really all that that is doing. This next layer up, I'm adjusting the tone of her arm. I'm sure it has something to do with the costume. Uh, this one here, I'm adjusting her nostril. You know, I absolutely hate when I have to waste an entire layer and a mask in order to do something so small and trivial. But as you can see, here we have this red tint inside of her nose, and this simply removes it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. So the next one up is her hair. So this first layer, I add more hair in just to make it fuller in body. And then this layer right here is going to lighten areas, just certain streaks in order to give it a little bit more texture and depth. Now this next layer is going everywhere but in her head and her hair. See that, how it cuts right around it? And what this one is doing in general is simply changing the contrast of it and making it a little bit more dynamic underneath the costume. And once we put the costume part over the top of this, it's just gonna help give it more contours around the curves. This layer up here seems to be the usual extra layer that does absolutely nothing. So I'm gonna throw that one away. And then now we come up here and we start dealing with the costume itself. This first layer is going to change it to an overall blue base which is why none of this coloring mattered, because as soon as I turn this on, it changes it anyway. So the costume itself isn't directly blue, but it will take up pieces of this during the highlight areas. Did I have to do it with a black and white and then tinting over the top? No, there are several different ways to approach colorizing inside of Photoshop. This is the way I chose to do it in this particular case. These next two layer groups are basically going to throw a general tint right over the top. So when I turn this layer on, it's set to multiply of 9%. You barely even see it. And this particular one is set to multiply of 100%. And this one really darkens it up. But basically, both of these layers just look something like this. You know, it just gives some more contouring and saying where I want more or less of the black. And that's all that those two layers are doing. And this layer is doing something similar. It's just darkening in certain areas. And on the surface, this one's going to look like it's doing something similar of just darkening over the top of it again. But if we look up close, you'll see what it's actually doing is it's throwing in a texture. This is one of the tricks I've developed where inside of this smart object, it's nothing but a blank white layer. That's it. There's nothing special about it, blank white. And I turn that into a smart object. But that allows me to place a smart filter onto it which is actually adding noise to that particular layer. So it's adding black noise onto the white layer. Then I can set it to multiply, which makes all the white disappear and sets the black to basically overlay the colors underneath it. And then I adjust the opacity to 84%. And then masking off certain areas of it. But basically that just added some texture to the costume and otherwise further broke up all those strange effects that are going on underneath the costume. Next up comes the glow. And the way that I created that glow is definitely way more complex than it needed to be. But this is just kind of how it turned out and then I just went with it. Sometimes you're just going so fast you don't even bother to clean up the mess behind yourself. But basically this army of layers are all effectively doing the same thing. Now generally I don't use paths inside of my images. But because this one was a unique situation, I thought a path would give me the most control. But here are paths for the hands, down here for the shoes, the emblem on her chest, and on the varying areas around her arms and legs. And this chest one was simply a copy of the original graphic that they gave me. And then I scaled it up and I created that one there because I really didn't care for this at all. I think it just looks silly. By taking each of these paths, you could then click a blank layer and then click on this one right here, which would then stroke the path with whatever color of brush that you had going on. So in this case, I created a cyan glow from this arms and legs one. 
And when we get up close, and you can see that it was actually created by using a layer effect down here. So the stroke is pure white, and then the effect gives it an outer glow as well as a color overlay of cyan. I go over the top with a nice white glow, just giving it a little bit more pop. And that's really all I did. I just keep going in succession for the different areas. Here's the emblem on her chest, the white over the top of that, cyan on her hands, the white on top of that. But they're all done the same way. Uh, these two aren't being used. And neither are these two here. They were in one of the versions, but not in the others. So for the one that we're doing, this is all that we have turned on and we're keeping. And all that is kept inside of this group mask here and doesn't let the effects wander all over the place. Now my first image that had the smoke here, I actually didn't put in any of the leather texture because quite honestly, I thought this image was busy enough without it. I already liked what was going on and I didn't have any particular need or desire to start wrapping leather around the model. But because it was originally suggested, I figured it was a good idea to actually include it. So in this second pass, I did include all of this leather. When I turn it on, you can see how it has like this ghosted outline. Now I don't know about that outline, but it doesn't actually do anything in the final version. So it's not something I really worried about. But as you can see, it just added this crackling texture around the top of it. And then we have this one here, which came down her leg. This one over here extends it down the foot. This one is the upper leg. And then it goes down the leg. And then it goes down her other leg. And then we have the arm and the other arm and then the front torso. And then all that gets put together inside of this layer here. But basically, they requested it, so there it is. And then this last group up here directly affects the face and otherwise fixes what's going on here. So this one opens up the exposure and the contrast quite dramatically. This layer here adds some warming tones back into the face using selective color under the neutrals, just warms it up. And this last group goes around the hair. And if you look, this layer is gonna make this more blue. The same way I did before, I just added another tint over the top. And then this layer here, pulled down the vibrance and boosted the saturation. Do you actually know the difference between vibrance and saturation? Vibrance affects the cools, saturation affects the warms. So in this case, it's kind of pulling down the blue a little bit and boosting up everything else. But quite honestly, in this case, it really isn't doing too much other than taking out the extra saturation that I put in here. I took it out there. But basically, this group of these two layers does this. It just gave an overall coloring so it wasn't quite as broken up with different colors going on in here. It just gave it a nice uniform solid blue color. But all those pieces parts get put together that creates the costume for our heroine that's gonna be placed on top of our background. So I'll take all of these layers, group them together, and turn them into a single smart object. This way, going forward, I'm only working with a single layer instead of all these different broken parts. But because everything is built with smart objects, I'm able to go jumping from one part to the next at any point in time, and I can tweak any little thing. And even if I want to adjust that noise that was placed inside of her costume that's buried in here somewhere, yes, even that I can just go back to, modify it, and then go back to my full file. And that's why I use smart objects. It gives me complete flexibility. And the last little bit for this model is after I combine all those layers together into a single smart object, I then did a subtle liquify on it. And basically, and all it really does is adjust the hips a little bit. See, nothing crazy. 
Okay, so let's get started with this background. There's several different parts that make up this background, but the base layer is this one here. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I went into the nearest big city, which for me is Boston, Massachusetts. And I walked around the city, had a nice day out with my family, but my core motivation was to find an image at an angle that matched that of the model. Now I actually parked my car not far from this particular scene. And this was the first area that we saw when we came out of the garage. I went around, I took several pictures, and I figured by the time it went to dusk, I would be able to get some nice light shots with the reflections going on. But I continued through the city, did all my sightseeing. But when I came back at night, there were several photographers that had their tripods lined up. And so I said, okay, why don't I just do what they're doing? Clearly they put more thought into it than I did. So I set up my tripod and I just shot right down the middle. And in the end, this is the one I ended up using. So from this point, I need to cut out the background because I need to replace that sky with something more dramatic. So here is the layer mask for that. When I zoom in here, you can see that what I actually have is a problem. I have this like vibration going on and that's shake from the camera. Now, even though it was on a tripod and even though I had it set up with a two second shutter to go off by itself, I still ended up with this shake. So I used Photoshop's shake reduction and this is what it did. See that huge, huge difference. Okay, and then down here in some other areas, you can see the before and then the after. Now there are definitely areas that it actually made it worse, and that's one of the side effects of shake reduction, which is why I actually have this particular, when I disable that, you can see how much of that vibration was actually coming in. So when it comes to shake reduction, some areas it helps, some areas it makes worse. You just have to be careful and play with that tool a little bit. You can't expect it to do wonders all by itself. So now that I cut out the sky, we have to put in a sky. And here was the sky that I had chosen. And as you can see, that's infinitely more dramatic than the original one. So now this particular sky I found off of Flickr and it was set up for commercial use with modification, which means that it could be used in the magazine and I could place it in my own image. There were actually several different sky shots that I thought were interesting. This one just kind of appealed to me. When we place our hero back over the top, she generally blends in, she fits in with the scene. However, there are two core problems that are going on here. One is there is no ground, so I actually had to create my own ground. And the other problem is that the brightest area inside of this image are these lights that are down here at the ground, and I don't want your eye to be distracted by that. So I added this curve, which just darkens that entire area down there so that it's no longer the brightest part in the image. The brightest part is actually pulling your eye up here. And when I am finished, it pulls your eye all the way up to her face. Now for this ground, I started creating it with this layer here, which comes from another shot that I had done of the same background. Basically, it's the same background. This particular angle was just a little bit lower because at the time I didn't know where the model was, so I just kind of shot a couple times up and down until I got something that I liked. But I was able to use that bottom ground and in order to make something like this more believable that she's actually standing on something, we need to add shadows. And so the first shadow I have is this one here that adds a cast shadow at the edge of the water and then her legs. And then this other shadow layer isn't really a shadow, but it actually creates just some depth to the image that darkens the outer areas and basically allows you to focus and just the key section in the middle. So as you can see, it went from something that used to be completely flat to something with a lot more depth and believability. Now see, all those different pieces put together actually create the base of our image. So going up the layers, we have this layer right here that adds more contrast into the image. 
As you can see, it just pushes up the highlights and the midtones, but it only does it in certain areas, being limited by this mask. If I was to hide this mask, you would see that it over contrasts the entire image. So I'm only doing it in certain areas. I'm going to come back and talk about this particular layer loss because this is a much broader topic that you'll actually want to know more about. So just stick with me for a few more minutes and then we'll get to it. Above this we have rain. Now the first thing I did was I went out and I tried to find stock art that had raindrops in it. Real rain and that sort of thing. And basically I couldn't find anything that really looked the way that I wanted it to. So I actually needed to create it all from scratch using some techniques inside of Photoshop, mixing filters together in order to create some realistic looking rain. Now this first layer that you're going to see here is another one of my Photoshop trickery smart object layers. When I double click on it, you'll find that inside of it is nothing but a straight black layer. That's it. It's black. There's nothing special about it at all. I take that and turn that into a smart object. And once I do that, that gives me the flexibility to do several different things with it. Most notably, I can apply all my rain as smart filters that allow me to go back and modify these special effects as needed. So the way that you create rain inside of Photoshop from scratch, the first thing that you do is add noise. So now because the layer itself is black, it's adding white speckles. If I started with a white layer like before, then it would create black speckles. But simply the difference is the end effect on how these speckles interact with the layer itself. It's one of those things that you have to play with. So I add noise, I add Gaussian blur to it, and then I add a motion blur. And this motion blur is where it tells it which direction that the rain is going to go in. And when that all gets put together, we have this. So as you can see, we have a before and then an after and before and after. And now obviously you're seeing the same thing I am, which is that it's lightening up all these dark areas. And that's the reason that we have this mask over the top. So I'm telling it that it can come in certain areas and not in other areas. And that also adds to the believability of the texture. So it's not this constant rain or otherwise just streaking on the page. It's more broken up so that it only happens in certain areas. So this just kind of looks like the wind's blowing it and it's pushing the rain around. And then I enhance that with a level. But if you notice that I have this little down tick arrow, what that means is that this layer of this special effect is linked directly to the layer below it and not to all of the layers below it. In order to link this layer to the layer below it, on a PC you hold down the Alt key and on the Mac I think it's the option. Maybe it's the Command key. I don't know. I just bang keys until I see it do that. So anyway, the rain special effect mixed with the levels, as you can see, it once again breaks up the rain and makes it more clearly defined as rain. And I mask off certain areas with a mask and I collapse that all into a single group. This particular layer, water splashes, is how I handle certain effects some of the time. Which means that instead of just adding white water splotches in this particular case, I'm not adding white. I'm adding a mask to a curve adjustment layer, which gives me more flexibility in the final effect. Let me show you. So here is the curve itself, which I've cranked all the way up in the midtones and the whites. I'm going to turn the effect on. And as you can see, it just added some extra water splashes up here on her shoulders. That's the before, and here's the after. And now because it's attached to this curve, I can actually move it lower or higher, adding more or less the effect. Once again, this is just another way that I work non-destructively. And I could have easily just taken a water spatter paintbrush and painted with white. I could have adjusted the opacity on the layer, which is fine. But doing it this way, I still have the ability to adjust the opacity, 
the blending mode, which I have to luminosity, as well as the curve itself. It just gives me more sliders and pull downs to play with. And as far as the water splashes go, uh, if you click on brush and you click this little tick down, you can see that these are the pre-installed brushes that come with Photoshop. And then down here at the bottom, I have a couple of my own, which are eyelash and iris brushes. But I otherwise have some lighting effect brushes as well as water spatter brushes. And all I need to do is click on this sprocket right here. And you can play with these ones that come inside of Photoshop or you can click load brushes. And here we can click on water splash, go load. And then you can see down here I have my water splash brushes. If I click on this one here and I paint on this layer mask with white, there you go. It just adds this splash anywhere that I put it. With this layer here, I actually found some stock art that looked like this. And by distorting it and changing the blend mode, I then changed the blend mode of it from normal down to lighten. And then I dropped the opacity down to 27%. I turn on this mask where I masked out some of the areas. And then down here at the bottom, you can see that it added this rain effect. This is before and this is after. And over on the other side, this is before and this is the after. And this final cloning layer doesn't do too much except for in here, I noticed that there were streaks between her legs and I just kind of removed them. So it wasn't as distracting. Now overall, this is the final artwork. However, when it comes to printing in a magazine, there are certain problems that you need to overcome. And my general problem is I like using vibrant, rich, saturated colors. Unfortunately, they don't translate very well to the printed medium, simply because the colors of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which is what printing uses, is not nearly as vibrant and saturated as RGB is on your monitor display. And even an inkjet printer is going to do a much more saturated, vibrant look to it than a printed magazine will, which is fine unto itself. The problem is if I was to just simply send my final files to the magazine without checking for how it's going to print, I would probably be very disappointed in the results because these colors are going to be automatically desaturated and dropped in the magazine without anybody really looking at them. I used to work in printing for 15 years. I know what happens on the printing side of things. And the reality of it is, as a photographer, you're taking the picture, you submit it to the magazine editor. The magazine editor would just give it to the designer. The designer is going to put it together and send it off to the printer. The printer is going to run it through a piece of software called a RIP, and the RIP is going to turn it into a CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And then the proof is going to come out. Someone's going to look at it and say, yeah, it looks fine. And then they're going to make the plates and then it's going to get on press. And then the pressmen are going to run it. They're going to tweak it a little bit, but ultimately it's going to look absolutely nothing like what you had wanted it to look like when you were looking at your oversaturated monitor. So for normal photographs, it'll probably look fine and you really wouldn't notice too much of a difference. But when it comes to artwork like this, that is intentionally oversaturated, I know certain areas are going to be muted and not looking correct. And if you want to see how your artwork would print in a situation like this, all you need to do is come up under view proof colors. Now, sometimes it'll look subtle like what I'm showing you here. I'm going back and forth and you may or may not even see the difference. But if I zoom up closer, to this top corner over here, and then I start doing that same change of using proof colors, which is otherwise control Y on the keyboard, you'll see what kind of a shift there really is. This is before, which is saturated, and this is after, which has been converted. You can see up here at the top, it's a CMYK as opposed to RGB. So this is RGB, CMYK, RGB, CMYK. There is a subtle shift. In order to compensate for that, I have this layer group that has this saturation handled 
intentionally by me so that when it does go to the printer, any variations would be subtle and expected as opposed to running through the entire system automated. Now you should also keep in mind that they were originally asking for one of those dark and moody superhero posters. And those work off of very monotone palettes. So in order to do that, I have another black and white layer that when I enable it, gives this entire image a blue tone. This is before and after, before and after. Once again, it's just blending over the entire image and allowing the foreground to blend with the background a little bit better. And then we also have this vibrance layer, which once again pulls down the extra vibrance. And instead of oversaturating with blue, it just gives a little bit more white of the paper. And so here is the final look of the image. When you zoom up close, there's plenty of texture and things going on. But once I compare it to the original image that I worked on, I guess it becomes a little bit subjective at that point. But personally, I like the original concept better because I find it to be more dynamic and more visually interesting. This image, not so much because it breaks a lot of the basic fundamental graphic design rules. For example, if you look at this image here, what is the first thing that catches your eye? It's her face. It comes in, it's drawn to the face. Why? Because it's the only warm area inside of the entire piece. Her costume and background are all cool. Warms come forward. On this particular piece, the warm areas are generally in here, but the other thing that comes forward are brights. And on this image, there are a couple brights, but the brightest areas kind of bring you in here and don't bring you out here into the background. For this image, the bright areas I've tried to keep in here, but there are some brighter areas off in the background. And basically your eye wanders a lot more inside of the final image as opposed to the previous image where your eye goes to the face, down across the arm, across the belt, up the arm, back to the emblem on her chest, her face, and then it keeps you within this general circle center of the image until your eye finally wanders off. This particular image, I'm kind of looking all over the place and I don't have any real sense of direction. I don't know where I'm supposed to look. I don't know what's the most important piece in this. But I'll be honest, by the time I reached this final version, I was more than burned out and just wanted to get through the project. Because when it comes to movie posters, you know, this one had more thought put into it where there's dead black space. You could put a logo down here. You could put the text down here at the bottom. This one, there is no dark area, so you can't put your logo anywhere. You can't put your text anywhere. I mean, you can kind of put something up at the top, but basically, but basically, since this was supposed to be a movie poster, this image meets more of the movie poster criteria than this one does. But generally, I don't mind either image. I like the way that they both came out, but being the artist that needed to do this work, I really wished I had more of an input on the front end where I could have chosen which model I wanted to use because this model just standing here with her hands on her hips isn't doing anything dynamic or particularly heroic. I just feel I could have offered a lot more to the project had I been involved from the beginning as opposed to the tail end after most of these decisions had already been made before I came on board. Thank you for watching another behind the scenes video. My name is John Ross, and if you would like to learn more about Adobe Photoshop, please go to www.theartofretouching.com where you can learn more tips and tricks to make you a better photo retoucher.